down to minus, oh gosh, I don't know whether I've got a note of it. Uh, I want to say 260 or something, Cliff, is it? I mean, ridiculously cold. I mean, we're not at absolute zero, but we're, we're getting very low. So immediately, if I can get something down that low to transport it, that's great. But I can hardly then put it in a bucket and carry it because it's immediately going to turn back into gas. So I've got to have some very specialized vessels that have these enormous pressurized and cooled tanks on them. There are a few designs, but here's one. And basically, the gas as liquid is there. And during the course of the voyage, there will be a certain boiling off. They'll use a, lose a little bit of volume, but nothing, nothing horrific. Uh, but you know, you've got some fairly big risks, marine and otherwise, associated with that. And when you get to the other end, so to speak, you've then got to turn it back into gas, and this is a receiving station, and then put it into your pipelines, your public gas system, however you use it, get it to the factories. Um, so turning it into liquid was very convenient to move it, but that's, that's why we do it and for no other reason. Now that was a very, very quick overview of quite a complex area, but I hope if nothing else, by showing you a few pictures of things you're not familiar with, you're starting to get some idea of the scale, the value, and some of the risks, um, which are diverse and interesting. Um, I'm very happy to take questions, comments, um, or we can do it as we go along. It's entirely up to you. Uh, has anyone any questions they want to ask now? Yes. Sir? Yeah, you said that uh, some of these platforms that are in the water have got a lifespan of, say, 25 years. Mm -hmm. What happens to them after that? Best question. Very, very good question. <coughs> when people started the platform, the last thing they were concerned with was getting out. Okay? So for a long time, no one gave any consideration. And many of the platforms were very small. And in the early, early, early days, they were literally a few feet in the water. And in the very early days, they were made of wood. Um, in a more modern world, decommissioning has become an enormous issue. Because first of all, if you're granted a license, or whatever arrangement you have, you are allowed to install the platform. Your license, or under whatever authority you're offering, will probably say, when you're finished, you've got to leave the seabed as you found it. Okay? So no rubbish, no platform, and no nothing. So increasingly, and particularly with concerns about pollution and abandoning workers, this has become an enormous issue. So the decommissioning plans have to be drawn up. There is an international convention, which I think covers, I think Northwest Europe is extended. But anybody who's being asked or allowed to drill anywhere offshore Africa, I can assure you, will have an obligation to remove what they were doing. So, yeah, the platforms have been designed the more recent designs yeah. are much more compatible for taking these platforms apart. Yeah. When they were building in the 70s and 80s, there were these huge monstrosities, and they weren't really designed for easily dismantling. But it's interesting, I mean, what they've been doing in Malaysia in a while, is that they've been dismantling some of these platforms, moving them to marine parts, yeah. and then submerging them, and they're becoming sort of artificial reefs. Yeah. So this is a process that was started in the US <coughs> I mean, call it there a week to week. Yeah. In certain circumstances, they will let you cut off your platform <coughs> and then move it, as you have said, to another area which is designated maybe as a uh, potential natural marine park. Because the one thing you put anything in the water, particularly platforms, they attract light. 
fish right in there. And this can cause a problem. I mean, I'll give you a, a rather crude but interesting example. Um, some years ago, uh, offshore Nigeria, which went on a lot of platforms, there was quite a problem with damaged platforms because fish accumulate around the platforms. And fishermen love places where fish accumulate, naturally. And what's the best way to <coughs> fish? If you want to get all the fish quick. Well, obviously, it's the throw a few hand grenades in the water. Well, they all float up, and you collect them in, and you go home. But throwing hand grenades in the water is not either the safest thing to do, and it may also cause a certain amount of damage to that. And there was a period the run prices were suddenly faced with claims because people were illegally fishing by means of hand um, I mean, that's an extreme example, but you will find on all platforms you get a certain amount of uh, uh, marine growth on. You've got an issue there, does that affect erosion? Uh, and in most places now, you will find that any platform is in a restricted zone. So the law will say you cannot come without proper authorization within, say, 500 meters or 1,000 meters. It gets ignored a lot. He does get ignored a lot. Especially on an unmanned platform. Yeah. I mean, I remember a long time ago, I was offshore Malaysia, I think, and someone went right to fish in the <laughs> yeah. Which is the boat. You're not allowed to do it. But at the time, somebody was. And you know, there are all sorts of strange things. There are a lot of safety issues, obviously. I'll tell you a favourite story of mine, which is really nothing to do with anything. But every platform will have safety procedures and radio safety rules evacuation. And there was a platform many years, a very big platform, Marshall, Australia. So they decided that they would have, as usual, Safety, but we'll have a okay. Uh, and they regularly have various safety you know, procedures and like And the one they decided to do was they decided what they do this time is they have a safety vessel permanently there. So if a man goes into the water, boat goes to the man, pulls it out. That's, that's good. And there are all sorts of arrangements made so people can't fall into the water, but people sometimes do. So they said, okay, what we'll do is we'll throw overboard a dummy, maybe with a life jacket on, we'll see how long it takes for the boat to get to the man. Seems sensible. We you know the water is probably not too cold, so we've probably got a reasonable idea of estimating how long somebody could live in the water. Okay, so far what can go wrong? So they threw the dummy into the water, the boat set off. Unfortunately, before the boat could get to the man, the shark got to the dummy. <laughs> now, as it was a dummy, no one was hurt in the making of this film. But it's not very good for morale if you're one of the men on board watching this operation. So, you know, things happen sometimes you don't necessarily expect. Don't fall in the water. Try not to believe. Yes. <laughs> okay, any, any other thoughts, questions? Sir? I think he just mentioned about unmanned platforms. Oh, unmanned, yeah. Yeah, say something about that. <coughs> um, there are quite a lot of unmanned platforms because many platforms, particularly on smaller developments, will be maybe only dealing with one or two wells. Okay, and when they're in a production phase, they don't necessarily need anybody there. So on a small, particularly shallow water installation, you might have a whole series of unmanned platforms. And all that's happening is oil is coming up to the platform and then going out through an export line. And they'll, they'll be inspected from time to time. They'll have a lot of remote equipment on them. So they'll be monitored from another platform or from shore. So often with a lot of the offshore platforms, you've got a lot of control onshore. So you can shut them down, alter what they're doing. So they don't in themselves, unmanned platforms, offer 
a particular danger, they're just a different risk. Um, but because it is a relatively new industry, I mean, oil and gas production probably goes back in an industrial sense to the second half of the 19th century. I mean, then we say the oil industry as an industry started in North America. Well, maybe it did, maybe it didn't. But um, moving offshore, offshore really only happened post the 1940s, really. Um, the initial offshore was not very far. I mean, I don't think it was till about 1948 that they put the first installation out of sight of land. Uh, many of the original installations were from the beach. Uh, so you see pictures, and you'll see some that I left you in that presentation of uh, piers going out, just built so they could put a rig on the end of it. So maybe you build a hundred foot pier out into the water, and you build a rig on the end of it, produce the oil ashore. But in theory, you're offshore. California had a lot of Oh, massive. massive. And um, I haven't dealt with it, although I'll probably talk a little bit about it in the other presentation. This has been an industry where so much has been learned the hard way. Whether it's pollution, loss of life, general safety. Um, and it's sometimes been tragic, but I'm afraid it's often the way. If you look at any big industrial uh, processes, uh, there have been a lot of things done along the way which now seem ridiculous. But at the time, it was sort of standard operating procedure. You know, we all learn. Sometimes it's an expensive process for underwriters and for humans. I think you deserve a break. I know I do. Sorry, that was my last question. Yeah. Um, the underwriters dealing with other risks like terrorism or. Good question. Yes. Um, certain risks um, tend to be identified and separated and maybe fall back. Terrorism is the most difficult thing to deal with. Um, and over the years, there have been all sorts of ways of dealing with it. The problem is the classic problem, you know, is it a, what's a terrorist to start with? You know, we could say it's someone who terrorizes us, but, you know, political motives involved, religious motives, bored, you know, upset with his employers. Big issues of just definition, let alone insurance. Uh, but broadly speaking, for offshore risks, you can get terrorism cover. Um, you can get war cover for most uh, non-fixed risks, i.e. FPSOs, for example, or uh, semi-submersibles or drill ships. The war thing goes back to a time when, in the 1930s, when insurers, particularly in the UK and Europe, decided war was such a catastrophe exposure that it was, there was no way they could underwrite it. Uh, they could underwrite uh, ships during war, but they, they were finite value. We could deal with it. There wasn't an accumulation. And underwriters voluntarily agreed in Europe, but not, I think, in North America, not to underwrite war on land. Okay. So for many years, you could not ensure war on land. The position has changed in, in recent times. Um, but uh, war is generally uh, a terror, terrorism risk, tricky. I mean, post some of the um, explosions in London, I guess it was the IRA that led to the pool reading. Yeah. Uh, I mean, we had uh, the IRA, the Irish movement, plant some very big bombs, do a lot of damage in London. And immediately the issue became, is this something we as insurers can deal with? 
and basically a pool system backed by the government was established. It was actually madly profitable for those concerned. Yeah, they've had very few claims on it. Yeah, 77. Yeah. Yeah. But you see, you get all sorts of complications. The Americans had a, a terrorism act where they had a, a system where the US government provided effectively terrorism cover. And this was for a finite period, maybe Congress passed it for two, three years. And then one day, I think probably because the Republicans and the Democrats were arguing about something like the price of fish, you know, something really important, um, they didn't renew it. And it caused chaos in the markets. Because if you owned a building in America and you borrowed money to put that building up, the people that you lent money to, sorry, they lent you money, almost certainly required you as part of the covenant to ensure your building against a terrorism risk. And suddenly, overnight, terrorism cover's gone, and there were all these organisations in breach of their banking covenants. Mm -hmm. And the problem was solved, but you know, it's a very complicated area. Enough? Yeah, you break for tea. Break for tea. Thank you for your time. I appreciate your patience. Ask me any questions. I have probably confused some of you. In some areas, I've probably confused myself. But <laughs> First of all, I'm going to talk a little bit about liability exposures and pollution issues. Um, then we're going to follow with um, an energy market review that Jeff is going to give. And we're going to run that into our last subject, which is really a panel discussion. So if you've got any questions, observations, that will be a great time to make them. And whatever happens, even if I'm still talking then, we're finished at four o'clock. Is that right? If necessary, Ken will grab me by the... So four o'clock is our deadline. Okay. I think you may find that some of what I'm going to talk about is more familiar to you than some of the other subjects, because broadly speaking, the principles of liability in relation to offshore upstream activities aren't fundamentally different from anywhere else. So the plan is how do liabilities arise? We'll look at insurances for upstream operations, what we can get, what we can't get, what's excluded, what we can buy back. And then lastly, the very obvious question of why do we buy coverage at all? Okay, how do liabilities arise? Well, none of this will be probably unfamiliar to you. Um, it's very important, though, to realize that when you talk about liability issues, you have to bear in mind the jurisdiction you're in, what is the law and practice applicable. Now, coming from England, it's very easy for me to make the mistake um, because England has been historically the source of much insurance law and practice and other law, it's easy to forget that every country has its own laws, its own practices, and sometimes there are significant differences. So it's always worth bearing in mind that there will be differences. Don't assume that because it's the law in your country, it'll be the law in another country, or that words get necessarily interpreted the same way. And that can be quite a big issue. I mean, I come from a country which has a tradition of a common law, I mean, statute law, case law. Uh, here in Kenya, I understand the uh, Kenyan constitution is the supreme law, but you have a system which is based on, to a degree, English common law, a mixture of common law, customary local law, a bit of Muslim law in some aspects. So it's an interesting difference. So... Let's look at some of these things. Liability at common law, taught under common law. Liabilities you assume under contract. Liabilities imposed by regulation on law. And some liabilities that oil companies and others will take on voluntarily. Uh, sometimes when we say taking on voluntarily, uh, often those things are taken on voluntarily because 
If they're not, they're going to be imposed on you, um, often by government. So, in a common law system, what sort of things can we get? Well, classic torts are things like negligence, being careless, nuisance. And then you do get sometimes strict liability, um, where you allow the escape from your property of something which is a hazard in itself. It is likely that in many common law um, uh, systems, you will be automatically liable with only very limited defenses. Um, trespass. Trespass actually can be to people in the form of assault, or it can be to goods, or it can be to land. And I give some examples there. Uh, defamation. Uh, and I'm not going to dwell on these because I think you'll probably be reasonably familiar with. And there are now what you might call some statutory torts. Some things which once were just common law torts, and as the law has developed, it's changed and they've become statutory matters, like products liability. Effectively, products liability started as a simple common law tort. Now, many jurisdictions will have um, a, a specific act. Okay. If we have a liability, what are the consequences of that liability? Well, they can be several. Damages is the obvious one, usually financial recompense. We might get fines and penalties, usually not insurable. We might have an injunction arise, basically a court order to take some action or stop taking some action. And in very limited circumstances, you have what is called self help. Uh, for example, tort law in England will tolerate um, reasonable force if I want to expel a trespasser from my land. So I could probably strong arm him off the property were I strong enough, but I couldn't shoot him and put him in a bag. That would be definitely not reasonable. Um, what are we going to assume under contract? Well, obviously the first thing, if we've got a contract, it's a contract for some sort of work or services. So the first thing we're going to assume is the responsibility to perform. And the nature of the work and how we're going to perform it is laid down. But there are many other things. We can put almost anything in a contract. And we may, through a mutual indemnity regime, uh, pick up the responsibility for another party's negligence. And it's very common, as you've heard in the oil industry, that we will be in a situation where an oil company, uh, when it contracts with, say, a drilling contractor, they will agree each will be responsible for their own property, their own personnel, and their own economic loss. And that is pretty universal. Uh, there may be some exceptions. And I think Cliff mentioned when we very briefly looked at Macondo, BP had a joint operating agreement with two other oil companies. They each had a percentage interest in the whole venture. I think it was 60, 20, 20 or something. Uh, and each of them was responsible, though BP were in charge of doing the work and contracting people, each were responsible for any losses arising out of that, even if it arose through BP's negligence. But they wouldn't be responsible if it arose through BP's gross negligence or willful misconduct, which raises a very interesting issue of what's the difference between negligence and gross negligence? What's willful misconduct? Not all... Um, Legal systems will give you the same answer to that question. And sometimes there is no good answer. So, for example, if you see a contract and willful misconduct is mentioned in it, it's quite likely there will be a clause in the contract defining what willful uh, misconduct is. So we don't have an argument afterwards. These are examples of liabilities imposed by law, or statute, or regulation, or license in various jurisdictions. Now, 
employer's liability you'll be familiar with, I'm sure, motor vehicle liability, there'll be health and safety regulations. Uh, in America, there's the Oil Pollution Act. How many of you are aware of the Nairobi International Convention? I expected you all to put your hands up. How can you not be aware of a convention named after this fair town? Disgusting. I'll deal with that later, then you, you've all lost points, I have to say straight away, because I was expecting everybody to proudly say, I am aware of the Nairobi International Convention, and then tell me about it. Very disappointing. <laughs> now, liability is assumed voluntarily. They're usually a pollution issue, and some of them are frankly not really terribly voluntary. I mean, for example, there is a system which operates uh, in the UK and can operate throughout Northwest Europe uh, called OPOL, uh, the Offshore Pollution Liability Association Limited Agreement. It's a voluntary agreement, um, has a current limit, I think, 200 million, is it, or 250? 250 million dollars is a limit where basically it will pay for oil pollution from fixed platforms, for example, okay? Uh, very limited defenses, so effectively strict liability. Now, in theory, it's voluntary, but you can't get a license for an offshore block in the UK unless you've signed up for it. So, I'm not sure you'd really call it voluntary. Uh, but that's an example, and that applies to part of the world. Um, one of the strange things is that there, there is no international convention dealing with oil pollution from fixed platforms. There are lots of conventions, and I'll mention them briefly later on, dealing with pollution from persistent oil from tankers, traditional cargo carriers, lots of those, uh, but nothing from, um, nothing from fixed platforms. And I see at the moment um, no likeliness that there will be for the foreseeable future. I want to talk very briefly about some of the drivers for pollution legislation, because pollution is a big, big issue in the energy industry. And the first thing I've got up there is a tanker accident back in 1967. A tanker called the Torrey Canyon, fully loaded with Kuwaiti crude oil, went ashore off the uh, UK coast, right at the far west off of Land's End, spilt 30,000 tonnes of crude oil, extensive um, pollution uh, in uh, southern England, uh, a blowout, and as a result of oil seepage from the well and from surrounding areas, there was a lot of pollution. Um, it was one of the real trigger events for the environmental uh, lobby in America. Uh, they'd never seen anything like this. Uh, it was serious, very serious. It also had another effect in terms of uh, the insurance market because this particular platform was operated by one oil company who had three partners. So there were four companies, all of whom I think had liability insurance in London. And the liability insurance was written in the way it was then. They each picked whatever limit they wanted and let's say they had $100 million. Let's say, for argument's sake, all four had $100 million. So if you were an underwriter and you'd written all four programs, which you might do, you were on four policies. And suddenly, every one of the oil companies was claiming their full limit for their 25% interest. So it actually led to joint venture clauses, which effectively say that if you have less than 100% interest, the limit will scale to your interest. So if you have $100 million worth of liability coverage and you've got a $25 million limit, usually the maximum you can recover when you have a, a case of uh, a loss where your interest in the asset is 25%, is 25% of that $100 million. 
Um, Mid-70s, there was a lot of onshore toxic waste from a, a dump site in New York State. It's a very famous incident, a very strange, a very long history. Uh, another major driver. In the mid-70s, there was an explosion in a chemical manufacturing plant in Italy, a huge escape of toxic dioxin, which is carcinogenic. Uh, another big driver for um, uh, legislation. Um, and then a case you may have heard of, Exxon Valdez, 1989, uh, Alaska, a lot of crude oil spilt. Um, and then obviously, much more recently, uh, Deepwater Horizon Maconda. And we'll look at some of these, um, uh, some of the effects uh, of these later on. Now, alternative bases for insurance coverage. I, I don't know whether you're familiar with this. Are you generally familiar with the concept of occurrence liability basis as opposed to claims made? Ring any bells? Thank goodness for that, a few nodding heads. I was afraid I might be on my own and then I would have been worried there, okay. Um, so I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this, but I put a couple of slides together just to show you the essential differences and that they speak for themselves. If it's occurrence, the event must happen during the policy period, but the policy period doesn't limit when you can claim. So if something happens this year, if you're on an occurrence basis, the claim doesn't, you claim isn't made upon you till next year. It will still be a claim under your liability policy this year. And there are pros and cons for the two of them. And I've set out some of the basic features there and also looked at some of the issues. Now, these very crudely are some of the issues. If you've got an occurrence, it's potentially a very long tail. Subject to any overall limitations on claims like maybe a statute of limitations, uh, that policy is live forever. Um, it's easy to sell it as a broker to an assured because they like it, because they understand it, and going forward it gives coverage for past events. One of the problems that became very evident though is because particularly in an in American environment, you looked at situations where claims were being made now for policies that were written in the 50s and maybe even earlier. Uh, and what might have been considered to be an adequate limit in 1950 or 1960 is nowhere near adequate right now. So they have a very long tail but the limits are not appropriate. And the conditions and exclusions may not be appropriate to a situation now. And then, of course, the other very basic issue is when people started to do what they called insurance archaeology to find the, last, the policies of 30, 40 years ago, and they found the policies and thought, oh, that's good. I've got some coverage under this policy. Then they looked at the list of subscribing underwriters, and quite a lot of them, after 40 or 50 years, weren't still in business. So... You know, they weren't necessarily going to make a recovery on them. Claims made, well, some of the issues of claims made are there. I mean, you are uh, assuming in certain circumstances historic losses, uh, but you are getting current insurers being asked to respond, so solvency isn't likely to be an issue. The limits you hope are going to be more closely aligned to the exposures and the conditions and the exclusions for an underwriter can be more closely aligned to current conditions. So there are some pros and cons. Um, you can get a current liability in certain areas for certain risks. Sometimes you'll have little choice but to be on a claims made basis. Upstream, there's just a string of, of policies. Uh, I'm not going to look at them in detail, um, but you can see the first one's an excess liability on a claims made form. Then you've got some clauses that go with that form, which are specific oil industry exclusions. 
and there are two standard forms, claims made in occurrence, and quite an old form, that bottom one, LPO 418B, an occurrence form which was essentially designed for US contractors. Okay, what would you find in a typical liability policy? Some insuring agreements, some exclusions, some definitions inevitably, some very specific conditions, some declarations, and then probably some endorsements. So the form is not very different from what you'd find probably in most liability policies. And starting with the insuring agreements, what would you expect to see in there? Well, you'd expect some coverage for general third party liabilities, legal and contractual liabilities for, for damage to property and loss of use, injury, death, maybe cost of defense, maybe the